Okay, we still have some folks logging on, but uh, we want to make sure we have time for the webinar, so we're going to get started. Good morning uh, again. This is Adam Goldstein um, from the Federal Home Loan Bank in New York, and we welcome you to today's webinar on the evolution of payments presented by the experts and our partners at, uh, at Boney Mellon. Um, we are going to get into this very interesting topic in a moment, but before we get started, uh, I want to also mention that our next session will be presented by Deloitte on uh, ESG, uh, the topic of uh, growing interest to our members in addition to the one that we're going to hear about today about payments. Um, in the ESG landscape, uh, that's something that's coming up a lot from the investment portfolio side of the business, uh, something that we as a federal home loan bank system are looking at pretty pretty heavily as a, the second biggest issuer of fixed income in the world, only behind the U.S. Treasury, obviously. Uh, we're looking at the bond issuance program and see if there's a space in there for, for ESG, given our mission and what we do. It would be a nice hook. So um, not only uh, do we invite you to listen to that presentation on ESG, not to talk about home loan bank bonds, but I mentioned that because if you have any interest in, in that, uh, in your investment portfolio uh, for home loan bank ESG, I, uh, myself, Tom Satino, we'd certainly love a call to talk to you about that to further our efforts at the system level. But again, Deloitte, Deloitte's presentation next week uh, will be about uh, the world of environmental, social, and governance, uh, how that landscape is changing, and it's going to be an interesting presentation. So we, we welcome you to join us for that. Um, and again, today we're, we're focused on um, on payments, the evolution of payments. And uh, again, this one was uh, this one came to you uh, from two two aspects. One, it was on the some of the surveys that we asked you to fill out at the end. Uh, some folks wanted to figure out how the world of fintech is changing and, and digital accelerating really exponentially during the COVID crisis and how it's uh, uh, impacting the financial services industry. Um, the other one was uh, as part of our long-term strategic planning process, we had Boney Mellon present to our, our board and our, uh, our strategic planning team, and they did such a, such a nice job on it. We thought we'd invite them to speak to you, our members. Um, so that's why they're here today. Also, before we get started, just a couple highlights. Um, pleased to announce approximately $36 million in housing grants are now available for our 2021 Affordable Housing Program, the General Fund. Uh, the deadline for submitting applications for the uh, 2021 AHP competitive round is Friday, May 21st at 5 p.m. Friday, May 21st, 5 p.m. The application package can be found on the AHP section of our public website, uh, including several resources to assist you in preparing your application. And also, um, our, our Home Buyer Dream Round opened on May 3rd. On May 3rd, that opened for participating members uh, and remains open through November 30th. Uh, the program offers grants up to $10,000. The Home Loan Bank will grant up to $9,500 towards down payment and closing cost assistance to eligible first-time buyers for purchasing homes uh, through one of our approved community-based member lenders. I wanted to make sure that that was avail uh, available for you and that you knew about it. And additionally, uh, that program offers up to $500 towards a, uh, the home ownership counseling process and the costs associated with that. Uh, as always, if you have any interest in the mortgage asset program, if you're not signed up yet, uh, we'd love to schedule a one-on-one -on -one to talk to you about selling your one to four family loan through our mortgage asset program at the Federal Home Loan Bank, which is afforded to you through your membership. And before I hand it over to Tom Satino, a couple details for today's webinar. If you have any questions, submit them at any time through the question box. We'll answer them at the end of the session with a Q&A. Uh, and as I just mentioned, uh, there, there was a survey at the end of this. It's so critical that we get your feedback, so we continue to put out content um, that's uh, meaningful to you, something that you want to listen to. Uh, we're happy to put it together uh, through our strategic partners, such as uh, uh, Boney Mellon. So uh, without further ado, Tom, if you want to introduce the team, uh, Flip it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today, by the way. Uh, I think it's going to be a great session. Uh, the evolution of payments, very um, timely and uh, current uh, topic uh, for us. But uh, let me introduce uh, Jans uh, Jansen Sabajau. Uh, he's the Director of Government Treasury Services at BNY Mellon. So he's, he provides treasury services and solutions to federal and quasi-government agencies there. He's been there in that role for over 14 years. So a little bit about his background prior to BNY Mellon, he has spent his career providing banking services and solutions to government agencies. I did a stint at PNC Bank where he worked with clients such as the Department of Veteran Affairs, the U.S. Army and Air Force, 
Um, he also worked at J.P. Morgan for a while, where he uh, worked with clients uh, such as the IRS, the Bureau of Fiscal Services, and Department of Energy. And then he uh, also did a stint at U.S. Bank, where he worked with the Department of Defense uh, Government Purchase Card Program. So real strong uh, background uh, dealing with uh, government entities. So with that, uh, Jansen, uh, let me tur turn it over to you to kick off the Evolution of Payments presentation. Awesome. Um, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Adam. Um, we're, we're super excited to be here today. Um, and right before we jump into the Evolution of Payments, I, I did want to introduce my subject matter experts and product colleagues, both Carl Slobicki and Sumner Francisco. Um, Carl is our head of strategic payment solutions at the, at the bank. Uh, within our treasury services department uh, responsible for our payables and receivables group um, that actually deliver to specialize um, to our multi-segment corporates and our bank clients in a private label capacity carl um, in addition to serves on the board of directors for nacha and the u.s faster payments council um, is the chair of our early warnings wholesale payments advisory committee and a member of the aba payment systems administration committee and the Clearinghouse's Real-Time Payments Business Committee. Um, so real strong background for Carl as well. And then I also bring in Sumner Francisco, who is a product manager at, at, at the bank covering our ACH and our account validation services, which you'll hear about uh, in depth today. Sumner is responsible for the product development and delivery, financial performance, and also liaises national um, with the National Automated Clearinghouse, NACHA, uh, and supports our client services in the markets and the client interactions. So without further ado, um, I will pass it over to Carl and Sumner, um, and please enjoy our presentation, and we're excited for your Q&A at the end. Great. Th thanks, Jensen. Uh, this is this is Carl Sobecki. Again, appreciate everyone taking the time and inviting us in here. Excited to share with you uh, some of the exciting things going on in the industry, of, of which there's there's quite a bit in the payment space specifically. So. Uh, a lot keeping us busy these days, and, and uh, the industry is really doing a ton here, um, which, is, which is pretty exciting. We're, we're going to walk you through today um, a couple of the highlights. Um, so, so first on kind of the digital immediate payments um, uh, spectrum, about some new payment rails within the, in the U.S., um, where, where they stand, where they're going, some of the, the considerations around each of them. Um, and we'll highlight uh, some of the things that BNY Mellon has done specifically to, to lead some of these, and, and I'll share a little bit about our own strategy within this space. Um, and then we'll also talk about some of the, the legacy rails like ACH and some things that not just doing, um, and, and then touch on some fraud and risk management capabilities that are in the market that are that are pretty complementary to a lot of what's going on in the payment space. Um, so we're, we're going to hit a high-level executive update um, and summary on a lot of these. Um, there's a ton of information in the back of the deck uh, that we wanted to provide as further reading material and reference for everyone to, to dig through, right, you know, in, in your own leisure and then kind of get more detail and, right, we're, we're certainly here happy to answer any questions and then we'll certainly open it up for, for some Q&A at, at the end of the session here. So start, starting with the, the immediate payment side of the house, and immediate payments is what we, we kind of use as an umbrella term for new digital faster payment capabilities right people call it faster payments digital payments instant payments real-time payments right you know there, there's a lot of umbrella terms that are out there um but but at the end of the day kind of there's a couple things that really we try to focus on here um, when you look at the us right predominantly and historically there's been a handful of payment methods available to us consumers and businesses right if you want to move money from one bank account to another you're handing someone some physical cash, you're gonna write them a check, or you're gonna use um, ACH wire or the card rails to do so, right? So, so there were five core ways to move money, and even in the card rails, right, you could even argue that the settlement actually used ACH, right? So you may even say there, there's really only four ways to move money um, where, where cards could be you know, viewed as a bit of an overlay service, but you know, they're widely considered the fifth pain rail. And that's been the case since the 70s. One of the things that's been exciting, right, and, and you know, this is something that was the first uh, new payment system in over 45 years within the U.S., was back in 2017 when, when the, the Clearinghouse launched the RTP network, Real-Time Payments Network. So this was truly the first new, alternative, different payment rail since ACH uh, was developed over, over 45 years ago. 
And, and it's, it's a net new way to move funds, messages between account holders at banks across the U.S. BNY Mellon was really excited to, to be part of that because not only were we working with the clearinghouse and, and some of our peer banks to actually design and build the system, workflow, specifications, operating rules, guidelines, working through liquidity model, but we actually um, uh, kind of put our money where our mouth is and we actually built the capability and stood it up as well. Um, and we were excited to be the first bank on the network back in 2017. So we actually joined the network back in November 2017, sent the first live RTP payment on behalf of one of our uh, brokerage clients um, over to US Bank, um, and, and the network kicked off. So it's been three and a half years now since RTP has been in production. Right now, they have over 115 banks on the RTP network and growing. They, they, they plan to have a couple hundred um, signed up and on live on the network by the end of this year. And just within the first three and a half years, those banks that are on the network actually represent close to 60% of every DDA in the, in the country. So 60% of all accounts are reachable over RTP for an instant, real-time, final irrevocable push payment. And the system never goes down. It's truly 24-7, 365, nights, weekends, holidays. If you want to send a payment to any one of those accounts at any one of those banks, you can do so within about three seconds or less. All right, you want to send someone money at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, three seconds later, money is going to be in their account. And they can go to an ATM and, and have access to those funds. So truly kind of resetting the, the infrastructure and the foundation of the U.S. payment system to provide rails that are fully available, fully instant, and fully transparent end-to-end, -end, right? And, and the, the transparency is a big piece because a lot of the times with some of the other payment rails, you know, ACH is a typical example. When you send an ACH out, right, you know, an ACH credit, if you think about payroll or uh, refund or, you know, relief payment or, or uh, whatever the use case may be, typically you get confirmation, right? The bank provides confirmation to the originator that, okay, we've sent it out, sit back and wait for your return. And if you don't get a return, you know, you, you have some expectation that the money's actually been applied on the other side, but you never really truly get confirmation of that. RTP is different because not only is it available 24 seven, can you send it instantly, but the fact that it's a completed payment actually includes the fact that the receiving bank has confirmed they've received the payment and have applied funds uh, to their account holder. So not only does it give you the ability to send it 24-7 instantly, but you actually get instant confirmation back that funds have been made available to, to the consumer. So true transparency all the way through end to end, um, which, which, which is great. So three and a half years, um, there's a lot of use cases that have been live and, and used on, on RTP, right? It's being used for gig economy, for uh, drivers, delivery folks. Um, instant payroll is a big use case. So, so getting away from the, uh, you know, Monday, uh, you know, through Friday, kind of weekly paycheck, semi, uh, semi monthly paycheck, monthly paycheck, those type of things. We've seen a boom of innovation around. I'd like to get paid every day and accrue my payroll and send me an RTP at the end of my day when I clock out um, and have instant money to, uh, available to cash. But, but everything else as well. Um, one of the things that, that we actually do within RTP is. Our bank's own accounts payable team actually uses RTP to pay uh, some vendor invoices. Um, so we're we're using it for for our bank's own uh, accounts payable vendor payments to some vendors within the U.S. Um, we have a variety of other use cases, right? Instant claim payments. Um, you mentioned payroll. One of the really exciting things about RTP, in addition to just the disbursements piece, um, and this is where I think is actually going to revolutionize the market a little bit more so is actually in the bill pay space. So instead of just push credits, right, when I'm thinking about disbursement use cases, RTP also has very robust messaging associated with it. So one of the messages is called a request for payment message. And it essentially is the, gives you the following function. So think about the bills that you would get or pay as a consumer every month, your mortgage payment, your phone bill, your utility bill, your insurance uh, premium, um, whatever it may be, these monthly bills, maybe you know once a year bills, those type of things. Typically, right, what you get in, in the mail is the following. You typically get a paper statement that says you owe you know, $100 and you have these options to pay. Rip this stub off the bottom, fill out a check, 
put it in the envelope and send it back, uh, you know, to, to this PO box. Or, you know, a lot of billers and you know, mortgage providers will also have the ability to say, okay, um, uh, go to our website here and pay us via card, put in your bank account, we'll do an ACH debit, and you can do your bill online. Or they say, go pay through your bank, right? Log into your retail checking account, um, type in our name and our address, and your bank will push a payment to us. In a lot of cases, the bank's actually pushing a check out the back door, um, which a lot of consumers don't realize. So back to RTP and this request for payment message, what this is actually going to do is the following. Using that RFP message, RTP provides billers the ability to send e-bills to consumers instantly over the RTP uh, network. So the phone company, utility company, insurance company, mortgage company, they could actually send e-bills to millions of consumers over RTP through this request for payment message. And me as the consumer, I'm gonna get the following. My phone's gonna buzz, I'm gonna look, it's gonna be a message from my bank. So whatever, however I'm signed up to receive alerts from my bank, whether it's text, email, or push notification, or all of the above, and they're gonna say, ABC Mortgage has just sent you an email. Please log into your online banking app to review and approve this payment if you, if you choose to do so. And I'm gonna be able to open that app on my phone, look at that email, say you owe you know, X dollars by Y date. Do you wanna pay, yes or no? Do you wanna pay it on a date? Do you wanna pay it now? Do you wanna pay a different amount? And as soon as I pay that, my bank is gonna send a real-time payment back to that mortgage company, that phone company, that utility company, and it's gonna be made available, it's gonna be instant, final, and irrevocable to that biller. So they're gonna know exactly what invoice is being paid, or what, what account, or what, what uh, you know, uh, loan is ultimately being paid on the other side because they sent the original bill to, to start with. And then they're gonna be able to completely do straight through, have straight through processing because they'll be able to reconcile that. And they don't have to worry about returns because over the RTP network, it's a final irrevocable payment. So it truly automates the entire bill bill presentment to payment to reconciliation process. And I think this is really gonna be, it's gonna kind of really shake up the industry um, in a good way, because it's the first time that this is gonna be available at a truly scalable basis, right? So, so e-bills exist today, here and there, a couple billers, a couple banks. Using RTP, this is gonna be the first uh, kind of foundational um, standard that's gonna get access to most uh, consumers across the country. There was actually a press release um, last week. Um, so, so if you look up the, the Clearinghouse, or if you can go to the clearinghouse.org, um, you'll see in, in their press section, last Monday there was a press release, and it was co-signed by 23 bank CEOs. Um, Todd Gibbons from BMY Mellon was one of them, but all the other big banks um, were, were there as well. And essentially the message was, a joint market commitment to make RTP bill pay a success and to bring this capability to millions of consumers across the US. So it was basically all of these banks signing on that line that this is a priority, we're all gonna support this. And what they said was the following, right? So we're kind of thinking, okay, well, how big is this? What, what's the scale? This the statement, which was really powerful is, by the end of this year, by the end of 2021, 40% of every online bank consumer in the country is gonna have access to receive an RTP e-bill. So, so if you think about it, right, you know, mortgage, uh, again, utility, phone, et cetera, all these recurring bills, by the end of this year already, 40% of every online bank consumer is gonna be able to receive one of these e-bills, put right on their phone, their mobile device, or online banking, banking experience, and they'll have the ability to send an RTP payment back to that biller. Um, really kind of, you know, getting mass adoption of this, and then that'll certainly grow over time as more banks come on the network and, and, and they progress there. So really a, a really diverse set of use cases over RTP. It's growing, you know, the, the double digit growth numbers um, quarter over quarter. Um, it's it's kind of like a hockey stick projection in, in terms of the, uh, the um, uh, volume increases that are shown here. And then our role is really helping our own clients, billers, corporates, uh, dispersers, those type of things. But we're actually also helping and supporting other banks. So, so I think the one unique thing about BNY Mellon, which, which is an exciting place to be, is we're also a banker's bank. So, so we have a, we're supporting a couple banks on the RTP network today. 
um, in, a, in a private label capacity so that they can connect to the network, use the investment in the architecture that we built, um, and then ultimately help them get to market faster at a lower investment. So we, we kind of have this double uh, strategy going on for bank enablement, but also corporate enablement at the same time. The other thing that I'll mention too, so think about RTP, what you probably hear about a lot too is FedNow. So the Federal Reserve, as, as most folks know, is also launching a service called FedNow. What is that? It's another 24-7, 365 instant payment system for the US. Sounds, sounds familiar, right? Kind of like RTP. Um, but this isn't that unusual, right? With an ACH, within wires, we have a public sector and a private sector operator. Right, the clearinghouse is the operator of ACH with their EPN uh, network. The Fed has Fed ACH, right? Some banks connect through Fed ACH, some banks connect through the EPN. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just ACH. Wires is the same thing. You have chips operated by the clearinghouse and you have Fedwire operated by the Fed. Um, but they both broadly support wire payments across the US. So the same type of model we, we see playing out here right now. The Fed now kicked off uh, this year their pilot program. So the FedNow pilot program, their goal is to be live by the uh, by 2023. So they have a 2023 target launch date. We we join the pilot program. Um, so I think there's about 120 participants in total, um, banks of all sizes, technology companies, those type of things. Um, this year is mainly an advisory phase. So working with the Fed on ISO specifications. Um, BNY Mellon was actually named in, in the press release that the Fed put out about a month ago um, because we played a core role in working with the Fed and then the working group to develop their ISO specifications for the network and ensuring that it's widely in line with, with RTP um, and, and giving other banks the ability to, to adopt that. Um, and then throughout the design phase this year, we're going to quickly get into the testing phase late this year and into next year um, as we get into then the production launch for 2023. So our goal with FedNow and RTP is, is relatively straightforward. We think both networks achieve kind of the North Star objective of getting US consumers, small businesses, large businesses, access to faster payments, right? The, the US is a very diverse landscape. We have 10,000 plus banks, credit unions and, and commercial banks included, um, millions and millions of small businesses, large businesses, et cetera. That, that's no small task to get uh, payment access out, out that far. It's a very dynamic network. So both operators are gonna give us that chance. Our goal is, is pretty simple. We wanna take a leadership role in both of them. We wanna be the first or one of the first to connect to Fed now, just like we were with RTP. And we wanna bridge the gap. So, so for the banks that we work with, for the corporates that we work with, our strategy is essentially solve the gap between the systems and use both of them to get broader reach. If a bank client, a corporate client wants to send a faster payment, we're going to leverage both networks to make sure we get the most reach to get that money out to that uh, consumer, small business, business on the other side. Same thing with the e-bill use case. And then the same thing on the, on the receiving side, right? Ultimately, being able to aggregate payments from both and then letting senders on one network or the other ultimately reach uh, the client base that we support. So there's been a lot of talk in the market about interoperability, lack thereof, those type of things. Ultimately, we see that as something the banks need to solve for, and then we're, we're trying to take a leadership role there um, to, to, to help solve for that. So a lot going on in RTP, FedNow, kind of the, the different um, dynamics of the two systems. So, you know, it's exciting because RTP is really growing. We're seeing a lot of adoption and use cases, more banks coming on. It's been in market for three and a half years. FedNow is really heating up, and they got uh, launch plans for about two years from now. And then ultimately, these two are going to converge, but not at a network level, really more how banks solve for that. So the, the last thing I'm going to hit too, so, so right, if you think about it, we reset the foundation for payments, right? Two new payment rails, the first two in 45 years, they're going to be the foundation for use cases, overlay services, um, ways for banks to get access uh, to their clients for, for better, better services going forward around kind of the entire financial services realm. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to hit on was um, alias and tokenized payments. So the other thing that we see as a, uh, a, a really uh, driving force is not just using payment rails like RPP and FedNow, which ultimately rely on 
routing number and account number based instructions. But being able to send money using an email or a, a mobile phone number. How do you know who this person is? Is this the person you intend them to be? And the bank account routing number is not something most people know off the top of their head, right? I don't know off the top of my head, every time I, <laughs> I need to see that, I have to look at my checkbook or I have to log on to my, my bank account um, and then look that up. But I know my phone number, I know my email, where right? it's readily available, it's non-sensitive information, and it can be leveraged to provide uh, payments. So one of the things that, you know, and most, most of you probably know Zelle from person to person payments and those types of things, right? You know, you go out with your friend for lunch or whatever it may be, and you got to pay them five, five, ten bucks back for, for splitting the pizza. Um, this is something that has gotten wide reach, right? So you have Zelle, you have, you have PayPal, you have Venmo, you have all these different options in the market. Zelle is the one owned and operated by banks. Um, so it goes directly to and from uh, bank accounts. And one of the interesting angles that, that we kind of see here is corporate adoption. So enabling banks and corporates to tap into Zelle to actually send money to consumers safely, securely, and instantly where you don't, where they don't have their bank information. So we really focus on the wholesale side or the business side of Zelle. Um, and we have a number of clients today doing things like insurance refunds, patient refunds, insurance claim payments, um, investment distributions, those type of things where historically checks were being used, right? I don't have John Doe's routing number, account number, so I'm going to have to cut him a check. All I have is his name and, and, and his address and those type of things. Now, if the entity sending the, those funds actually has their phone number or email, not only can we confirm if that's actually registered in Zelle, we can confirm if the name that this uh, entity has is actually matching the name on the Zelle network. And we can tap into Zelle to get an instant notification that your insurance claim has been paid, you know, your refund has been processed, whatever the use case may be, and money's in your account. Before you even look at your phone, you'll see the funds will be available for you. So Zelle is really an overlay service because it uses ACH, card rails, and, and RTP to ultimately settle, but it really provides the, the jump or, or kind of that leap uh, position to get off the paper checks without needing that sensitive bank account. So, so one of the things that we do with Zelle is, is enabling, again, businesses, but also banks to access, access this uh, capability. And we're also working with Early Warning, who owns Zelle, to even build out now the, the bill pay use case. So just like we were talking about RTP bill pay, one of the things that we want to work on with Zelle is rolling out the ability to then send e-bills through Zelle. So giving the ability to send an e-bill to a mobile phone number, to an email address, and again, not requiring the sensitive bank information to do that. So you can see there's a kind of a lot of convergence of all these different things. Um, ultimately, they try to achieve the same goals. How do you pay instantly to anyone across the US? And then how do you also present a bill or an invoice to someone anywhere across the US? And using Rails that are 24 seven, using Rails that are fully available, um, and using items that, that process payments instantly without delayed settlement. So a lot going on, RTP, Zelle, really exciting progress on both fronts. Um, both of them are seeing really um, aggressive adoption and uh, Zelle publishes every quarter their, um, their statistics in terms of the number of transactions they're processing, the growth quarter over quarter. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually really impressive the, the growth they've been able to see there. Um, and a big piece of that, right, is, is also um, what we mentioned here, which is, is business disbursements. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it to Sumner. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, ACH, right? So all this new stuff, um, with RTP, FedNow, Zelle, really exciting, but Notch is actually doing quite a lot as well within the ACH network um, to keep ACH relevant, make it more available, um, and enhance ACH for better, faster processing. Um, and then we'll also talk a little bit about risk and, and fraud mitigation as well. Um, so Sumner, you want, you want to take it over and, and jump into ACH? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Carl, and, and good morning to everyone who's joined today's session. While Carl just provided a very, very excellent overview of some of the newer payment rails, I'll be talking about some of the recent advancements with ACH, which, as you know, is a rail that is a, a handful of decades old. Uh, but, you know, just because ACH is, has been around for a long time doesn't mean that there, there haven't been significant innovations taking place in the network. 
um, that ultimately provide tangible benefits to uh, both consumers and organizations alike. In the era of digitalization, um, it's really changed the way business has, is and has been conducted. Now more than ever, there's been an expectation by consumers and businesses for instantaneous exchange of information. Uh, we've seen this with a transaction transition from faxes and mails to emails. Uh, when you go to the restaurant these days, right, no longer do they have like physical menus. What do they have? They have QR codes that you can scan, pops up the menu on your phone. Even hailing cabs and ride shares is an electronic process now, um, and it's and one that's done in real time. Um, so we're now seeing this migration um, happening. Uh, within the payment space itself. And, and people specifically want real-time transfer of funds. And as Carl mentioned, this is one of the main driving factors for, for RTP and the faster payments uh, use case. Not to realize this market trend and to futurize the ACH network, they began to implement the same day ACH. Um, since you know, up until that point, the ACH network was exclusively a next day settlement rail. Same day ACH was piloted in 2016, where the scope was initially very quite, it was quite small, uh, to be honest. But if you fast forward to today, um, there are now three same day ACH processing windows. The third, uh, the third window just went live this past March, which allows the same day settlement uh, for an additional two hours up to 6 p.m. Um, you know, so we're expanding the availability of, of the service. And, and now the transaction limit is about or is one hundred thousand dollars for both credit and debit transfers. Um, and, and speaking about transaction limits, uh, Notcha's direct members recently approved the expansion of the same day ACH transaction limit from one hundred thousand to one million, and that's going to be effective in, in twenty twenty two. At the current rate, I expect both the availability of same day ACH and its transaction limits to continue to expand in the future. You know, when we take a look at the popularity uh, of same day ACH in Q1 2021, we see uh, a year over year increase of the volume of about 88% over Q1 2020. So it's something that is in focus um, with NACHA and, and uh, with, with also being with Mellon. Um, in, in evidence by you know the, this rapid growth. In addition to being able to support San Diego ACH, uh, BMI Mellon recently added the capability to support ACH origination via API, uh, which echoes really the demand for real-time information exchange. So instead of uh, being able to send a NATRA formatted file through to, to a site through SFTP or direct transmission. Uh, clients can now initiate API requests containing auto formatted items that, that we can process uh, for you. One of the byproducts of innovation in the payment space um, is that it prevents new opportunities for fraudsters to commit uh, equally innovative uh, ways uh, to, uh, to commit fraud, essentially. Um, and this was more or less the foundation for Nacho implementing the the uh, Nacho Web Debit Rule this past March. Uh, that specific rule makes an account validation mandatory for originators of, of web debits. And what it, this is one of the main reasons BNY Mellon decided to offer uh, account validation services, or what we are calling AVS. AVS is a real-time inquiry service that enables clients to confirm the status of an account but also verify the ownership of an account as well. Um, we, we see this as a very powerful solution and, and definitely relevant in today's world where everything has become digitized. Um, so the, the question really is, you know, how do you gain comfort working with a counterparty that you cannot physically see or meet in person? You know, how, how do you know that you are working with who you're thinking you're working with? Uh, and, and actually, I'll just give you a stat that in 2019, in a 2019 survey by AFP, approximately 82% of corporations that were polled had experienced actual or attempted fraud. And this was the highest recorded figure for that poll, which is which is conducted on an annual basis. So, you know, the the evidence behind, uh, you know, the, this uh, trend is there that fraud is 
is increasing, especially in, in the digital age. So um, AVS helps users gain that comfort um, since it, it helps to identify fraud before any payment is made. So it's really meant to be an inquiry service to revalidate a counterparty before any payment is made. And since AVS can confirm the status of the account, it can also help to identify invalid accounts before making payments as well. Uh, and for clients, realist, uh, realist, uh, the benefit to them is that this can help reduce their return, their payment return rates as well, and the, uh, the, the costs associated to payment returns, which can uh, add up over time. We see AVS as a very complementary service to all the payment rails that we provide, uh, including ACH entries, checks, uh, but especially with real-time payments and uh, with wire transfers as well, which are by nature instant and, and irrevocable. So this tying back to what I was mentioning earlier, right? In, in the age where you, you haven't physically met and you, and you don't know your counterparty, um, and you're sending these instant and irrevocable payments, how do you gain that comfort um, that uh, that you're working with a, a credible uh, counterparty? So um, that's where AVS plays a, a part. So you, you have one half of it, which is the real-time exchange of, of funds, that's the real-time payments and, and wire transfers, but also the real-time security that if you're working with a legitimate party, that's where AVS comes into place. Uh, BNY Mellon partners with Early Warning Services to offer AVS. Early Warning, as Carl mentioned, is the operator of the Zell network, uh, but they also offer other products that enrich the payment experience. For AVS, we use what is termed as the, the National Shared Database, which is a table of account and transaction information that's maintained by Early Warning. Um, this information within the database is contributed by you know, many of the large banks in the U.S. Uh, on a daily, uh, uh, even yeah, a nightly basis. So the source we do, the, the source that we use for uh, the comparisons and the validations from the accounts uh, is leveraging bank consortium data. You know, at a very high level, the, the way an inquiry works is that our client would, would send us right, a routing number and account number. Uh, to validate the account status, and if uh, the client would want us to validate the ownership of the account, we're looking for also a name, but can support the other ownership elements like uh, the social security number, tax identification number, date of birth, address, uh, just to name a few. We take that routing number, account number, and name, and we cross-reference it with what's on the National Shared Database. Early warning will respond to us with uh, you know, hundreds of scores and codes. Uh, indicating matches in the, in the account status. We translate all of that detail on a, into a simplified response to, to our clients in, in the form of a binary, uh, the, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down uh, response to our clients. So we'll say, okay, this routing, uh, this routing number, account number is valid uh, or invalid. Uh, this, owner, this owner that, that was uh, requested is, is not the, is, not the does not match what's on file, so it's an invalid owner. Um, and so, at a very high level, that's that's the flow there. But um, you know, AVS itself, it, we've see we've launched it uh, late last year, and and it's really it's really exploded, uh, and it is very widely popular with with our clients. We're seeing AVS being used by a multi, uh, multitude of organizations, uh, from the accounts payable department of, of many. Uh, corporations and companies that we're working with to pre-validate vendors that they're setting up to governments uh, and government entities that are pre-validating applicants of early programs. Uh, but we're also uniquely positioned to white label the service to other banks as well. Um, so, so in sum, right, I covered uh, some of the innovations specifically around same day ACH with, uh, with, within the ACH network. Uh, and then, you know, um, we're, we're looking at, you know, in terms of the experience, the transaction experience becoming in real time, uh, what that looks like in terms of transfer of funds, but also what does that look like in terms of, you know, um, uh, pre-validating and, and securing that, uh, that, fund, that transfer of funds. So uh, we'll, we'll pause there. Uh, Carl, did you have anything else to add on that front?
Yeah, that, thanks, Sumner. I appreciate the update. Right, you know, Sumner mentioned, I think account validation services is, when we look at this, right, it's, it's kind of, it's very complementary. It's, it's a unique area, too, because it's the first time that we at BNY Mellon actually moved out of the payment space within our treasury services business to more of a pure data service, which was kind of an interesting development, right? Historically, us and another kind of treasury services banks we're, we're doing right payments and payment related origination reporting and those type of things. Um, this is a standalone data service really to help fraud and, and risk mitigation, um, ultimately as, as a pre-step uh, to payments. But, but it, it, it's, as someone mentioned, it's really agnostic, right? What we're doing here is confirming, is this account actually open and active? And is this party the owner? Um, and then, right, you know, the, the sender, accounts payable department, insurance company, you know, healthcare company, whatever it may be, can then leverage any of those rails we talked about earlier, um, right? ACH, real-time payments, wires, those type of things, to then safely and securely transact. So, um, NACHA, right, is kind of taking the first step to kind of make it table stakes, right, for for the web debits, um, for from a, one of the biller use cases. But but the trend we actually see is most most are actually adopting this pretty widely, not just to comply with the, the NACHA rule, which is really specific to online debits to consumers but across all of receivables and across all the payables, because it's really just stepped up um, uh, risk and fraud management across the board for all those use cases. So it's, it's kind of a, the catalyst to, to move a lot of entities across the market, um, but when they do, right, I think what we see is not many, not many, if any of them are actually just focusing on web debits, they're really looking across their business here. Um, so, you know, certainly a big, big industry trend. We think this is going to continue. There's a bunch of stuff going on, even on the international side with SWIFT, um, where this type of capability is being looked at internationally. So how do you pre-validate international and cross-border payments into, into other regions? Um, and SWIFT is doing a lot in the pre-validation space to kind of take the same concept and do it for, for cross-border payments. Um, and and we, we've been working with SWIFT on that front as well. So certainly not just a U.S. phenomenon. Um, you know, SWIFT is, I think, one of the leading providers that can solve for that internationally. But but here, early warning, um, and in our opinion, certainly has the, the biggest breadth and scope um, of accounts and, and ownership that they're able to confirm. Um, and hence the reason why we were working with them there. So and I know there's only about 15 minutes left here um, in the allotted time. Um, and I know we wanted to to open up for for some questions and, and comments. So maybe I'll, I'll pass it back to either Jansen or Alyssa, um, and maybe we could we could open up or, or open up for some questions. Yeah, no, thank you, Carl. This is Jansen. Um, I think to your point, um, you know, this is a great overview by you guys, and so we're just um, we're ready to to answer any questions that may have come come through during the presentation. Sure, Jansen. Uh, this is Tom Satino. Um, great presentation, by the way. And one question I actually had was, um, how is this going to change the way banks um, um, manage and credit unions? How, do, how are they going to manage their uh, Fed account uh, if you have a 24-hour payment system? I mean, um, it, it's going to be pretty tricky. Uh, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. This is Carl. I'll, I'll take that one. It's you know that that's that's uh, that's that's the very top of mind for, for any banker looking to to embark on on either RTP or Fed now. And to be honest, there's a there's a, there's kind of a layered answer to that. So I'll start I'll start with RTP. The way RTP solved for 24/7 processing is in the following manner, right? So you think about okay, well if, if a Fed master account is only open during these business hours, how or how is RTP moving money 24-7? And, and they, they address it in the following way. So there's a concept called a joint account at the Federal Reserve. Um, if you look up, you know, Federal Reserve joint account, you, you'll see um, there's some uh, rules around uh, what type of entities are allowed to apply for a joint account, how it operates, and those type of things that the Federal Reserve allows for. So for RTP, what the clearinghouse did is they opened up a joint account at the New York Federal Reserve, and every bank that participates in the RTP network is a joint owner of that single account. So it's one master account at the Fed, and every bank, all those 115 banks sign you know, a couple page addendum, and they all opt in to be a joint owner. So it's collectively owned by every bank on the network. And the clearinghouse acts as essentially the administrator or the, the record keeper of who owns what in that account. 
So if you kind of think, think of it this way, right, just to kind of simple, simplify it uh, down, the clearinghouse is saying, okay, if 100 banks all put a million dollars into this account, we're trusting the Fed to hold the funds, right? Because what, what better place to keep the funds um, than the Federal Reserve account? And when Bank A moves money to Bank B, nothing has to move at the Fed, right? Bank A has good funds in the Fed account. Bank B has a position in that Fed account. All the clearinghouse is essentially doing is doing a subledger entry, saying minus $100 Bank A plus $100 Bank B. The Fed account stays the same, right? So there's still, you know, $100 million, $1 million for every 100 banks in there, let's say, and Bank A moves $100 to Bank B, nothing actually moves with the Fed account. The only thing that changes is that the clearinghouse is updating their subledger, which they keep updated on a continuous basis. So even when the Fed goes um, uh, down on you know nights, weekends, holidays, those type of things, and the Fed master account's not open to move money, the clearinghouse, as long as there's good funds in that account, the clearinghouse can keep doing the subledger. So we can move money to another bank on a Saturday as long as we have enough money in that in our position there for the clearinghouse to debit on their subledger. Ultimately, if we send too much money, we have to wait for the Fed uh, to open back up. You know, on Sunday night, we need to top off our position and then keep sending. But as long as you have good funds in there, you can, can continue to manage it. Now, the, the other thing that's going on at the Federal Reserve is the following. Right. So we just saw in March, um, the Federal Reserve is looking to extend liquidity management and capabilities. So they extended Fedwire, they extended their, their, their NSS, National Settlement Service. And, and we think that's going to continue, right? Just like with ACH doing later processing, the Fed is also looking at later processing in Windows, Fedwire and NSS. And the Fed now is ultimately then going to support in 2023 the ability to post debits and credits directly to a Fed master account on a continuous basis, right? So that actually opens up implications around, okay, how do you reconcile that? So one of the things that, that we've seen, right, is ultimately um, trying to automate that process as much as possible, right? And, and banks are implementing things like target balances, um, watermark alerts and indicators as if, if you set a, a target balance of, you know, just generally million dollars, right? Um, and the balance goes down because clients are sending payments, sending payments, an alert is triggered when you get down to 800,000 or 500,000 or whatever uh, the institution sets it at, or even a watermark alert um, at the higher end. Um, and then what we're looking at too, right now it's kind of manual and operational where, okay, a water alert, uh, watermark alert gets triggered, you need to move money in or move money out, but ultimately, a lot of banks are looking at uh, systemic ways to um, uh, trigger automatic funding or drawdowns based off of predefined rules that their liquidity and, and operations team define. And the other thing that's going on um, that I think helps, right, for, for those entities that say, okay, you know, we don't have a team to support this 24-7. No one's sitting there Saturday at noon waiting for a liquidity alert to log on and take an action. The other dynamic that's going on on both networks, um, they call it a funding agent in the, the RTP network, and it's a correspondent banking model in the Fed network, is actually using other banks to help support that. So in the RTP network, um, you can actually use a funding agent to help manage your liquidity position. So a funding agent will manage one position and basically pool funds for hundreds or even thousands of credit unions and banks to help manage that money centrally and even pool and net funds to help more efficiently manage that so that each individual credit union doesn't have to do that on their own. And in the FedNow piece as well, um, they, they're allowing uh, correspondent banking. So you know, just an example for BNY Mellon, we could foreseeably allow hundreds of thousands of banks to clear against our FedMaster account so we can manage the liquidity on behalf of a pool of entities again and then our liquidity and operations team can do that, manage uh, the, the operational component of that. So both, both think, I think both networks kind of appreciate the challenge there. Um, and they've created this banker, these kind of banker's bank model of either a funding agent or a correspondent bank that can help aggregate and pool those funds and then, and then also uh, uh, operationally manage that on a continuous basis. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, one follow-up question for that. Do you, have, do you envision 
uh, entities uh, giving up their Fed account, just going with a correspondent bank uh, going forward, or would you still have the Fed account open in, uh, in conjunction with the using correspondent bank? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, the answer is really uh, either option is viable. Um, you know, and, and talking with the Federal Reserve and, and a lot of the work we've done, right, you know, there's certainly an appreciation for, and we've seen it with RTP already, right? There's a number of banks that do it all themselves, connect directly, manage their own liquidity position, but when you get past kind of the top, you know, 50 banks or so in the country, most of them are going through a TPSP, to, um, a third party service provider or, or a funding agent, um, because just it's just not efficient to build um, the connectivity directly, it's not efficient to manage the liquidity directly, and, and there's kind of these aggregator models that are going on. We, we expect the same to happen on the FedNow service. Um, so even if an um, entity has their own uh, FedMaster account and they want access to FedNow, they could still leverage a correspondent model with another bank to access FedNow, right? And then it's all ultimately just managing the FedMaster account as they do today, and then ultimately working with um, whoever their correspondent bank is to access real-time um, FedNow payments, both inbound and outbound. So the, the, that hybrid model is certainly an option um, if, if those want to clear. And, and it's, it's kind of like a, it's almost like a plug and play model, right? Where you can say, okay, would a credit union want FedNow payments posting directly to their FedMaster account and having to reconcile that and maybe leaning on um, a, a partner for more of the technical interoperability? Um, of receiving messages and you know doing kind of posting to DDA systems and those type of things, or do they really just want to say, okay, you post this, you manage this, clear everything into your Fed account, and then there's some sort of uh, like a traditional correspondent like Nostro account, right? You know, an account on the BNY Mellon books where we can debit and credit, and um, the banks just kind of settling up uh, Monday through Friday and kind of normal business hours. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I do have a couple more questions. We're getting a little uh, at, at the end of the timeline here, but um, the, uh, the the one question that came in is that uh, uh, it asked that does the uh, account validation system validate international accounts or is it just domestic? Great. Yeah, the ABS with the early warning is just, just U.S. accounts. Um, so, so early warning, they aggregate uh, trend, uh, accounts, uh, status account owners for U.S. accounts and U.S. banks. Um, and some are, gave info to some of the sets about 85% of all accounts can be uh, validated real time based on the status, about 65% of all U.S. accounts can be validated for the ownership, but, but it does support both domestic payments and international payments coming into the U.S. Um, SWIFT is really, I think, leading the charge there on pre-validation efforts around um, accounts in other countries and then more on the cross-border landscape. Yeah, and then just that on there, more specifically, right, the inquiry requires an ABA routing number uh, and an account number uh, to, to complete the inquiry. So uh, those, at a minimum, have to be available for, for ABS to, to be used. All right, thank you. And does the, AB, does the ABS uh, validate other points of information like Social Security number, uh, tax ID, and uh, date of birth? Yeah, so it, it, if in addition to a name, which is a minimum required field for the ownership validation, um, you know, those elements that you just named, social security number, date of birth, tax ID, address, even government IDs, right, if, if there is a um, if there is a passport number on file, if there's a, a driver's license on file, uh, some, of, some of these other uh, ownership elements are also supported. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think that wraps up the, the presentation today. Uh, we went through the questions and uh, I just want to thank you. This was great information and uh, very interesting as well. Interesting times we're in and uh, things uh, seem to be uh, on a trajectory to change quickly. So uh, thanks for joining us in our membership today. Um, Appreciate the and time. And I just want to thank you. What's that? Appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then I wanted to thank the membership for attending. Uh, just uh, one last thing to note, uh, what Adam had mentioned earlier on today, uh, there, our next webinar is Thursday, May 27th, uh, starts at 11, we'll end at 12. That's uh, Deloitte and Touche will be presenting on uh, the ESG and climate risk, and, and it's uh, titled An Introduction for Financial Service Organizations. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thanks to the team at BNY Mellon, and uh, I greatly appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody.